Thumbs up. Just remember to unmute and I uh, hope you're all ready to join us from the field because we have a really exciting conversation today. Um, we often hear, what does UDL look like in practice? And sometimes we'll get questions like, well, can you, can you integrate UDL in visual arts? And today we have, um, we have experts from the field who are ready to share what UDL looks like in their visual art classrooms. And what's really exciting about this is that what they have to share, what they have to share can really be applied across content areas, across disciplines, across age groups. So if you're a high school teacher, an elementary school teacher, middle school teacher, we hope you're here. We hope you share this recording uh, with your colleagues um, because this professional learning community is fabulous. They've been meeting together for the past couple of years. We're so lucky to welcome them today and they're going to share some of their stories, some of their struggles, and some of the lessons learned in their UDL journeys. So our goal is to really share their stories and hopefully make connections for how all educators can implement UDL. So uh, before we get started and before I introduce them, um, I do want to again make sure that you all feel that you're able to contribute to the conversation. So um, you can open the chat panel from the center of the top of your Zoom window and just be sure to choose all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu from above where you type so that everyone's able to hear your words. Again, you can turn the closed captions on if you want. And if you're listening to this recording at another time, we'll make sure to say out loud what's typed in the, in the text uh, chat. So whether you're on the phone or listening to the recording later, you're able to access that content um, in, the, in the Zoom chat window. Um, we also invite you to share through Twitter. So if you are listening to the recording at a later period of time, um, please feel free. We'll, we'll always get back to you through Twitter. So you can use the hashtag CastPL um, or the at cast underscore UDL handle. And uh, we do have a digital handout today as well. So it's an alternate representation of some of the information. And there are uh, resources that are available for you to be able to dive deeper into some of the content from our panelists. Uh, and so that link is provided to you right there in the chat box. It's a bit.ly uh, link um, that you can all be able to access. Um, so without any further ado, I guess if you have any questions, please feel free right now to start typing in the chat box. Uh, but I do want to um, get started because these stories um, are very exciting. It's my, uh, my honor to be able to introduce Liz Byron, who's led at the Art of Variability team. So Liz, thank you for being here. And I'm hoping you can really kick off and share an overview of the scope of this work. And, and we'll just jump right into the conversation. Thank you so much, Allison. And we are so happy and excited to be here. And before we get into the examples of UDL in the arts, I just want to give a little bit of information about our PLC, which stands for Professional Learning Community. Today's presenters are part of a PLC of visual art teachers in Worcester Public Schools. Worcester, if you don't know, is an urban district approximately 45 minutes west of Boston. The PLC is part of a collaboration with VSA of Massachusetts. VSA is a nonprofit and they focus on providing arts based experiences to populations with special needs. I was hired through VSA to lead the Worcester PLC because I have previous background in UDL, uh, visual art and special education. Our PLC, as Allison had mentioned, is creatively named the Art of Variability. <laughs> it is comprised of two reflective and dedicated administrators and nine extraordinarily devoted visual art teachers, as well as three VSA team members. So we meet once a week via a Google Hangout. We have weekly assignments, and several times a year, we participate in day-long workshops, and we're currently finishing our second year of this PLC. I cannot say, um, I can never say this enough, but these teachers are really unique in their exceptional inquiry, their professional application of UDL, and their growth mindset. We're so grateful, and we're so excited to share with you five different UDL visual art stories I feel like we need a drum roll here because it really, the energy, the enthusiasm, um, just so that, you know, you all hear, uh, the first time I had a conversation with this PLC 
it moved me. I mean, I had goosebumps. I decided we have to get this story out. We have to share what they're doing. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you all keep going. Well, this is the team that you were just talking about. We have Katie and Kate, me, Liz and Lizzie. And, um, we're each going to be presenting a unique take on UDL in the visual arts. While we do this, the person who goes uh, before the next will be introducing the next presenter. So I'm just going to um, briefly mention Lizzie Fortin right now because she will be going at the end. Lizzie will be introducing Katie and she is a Worcester Public School visual art teacher and will be, like I mentioned, presenting at the end. So Lizzie, why don't you go ahead and introduce Katie? Thanks, Liz. Um, this is Katie Walsh's third, third year teaching art for the Worcester Public Schools. Next slide. Uh, which is K through 12 at three different schools in the district to over 500 students per week. She feels very fortunate to have discovered UDL so early on in her career and is always seeking ways to remove barriers in her classroom and on her art cart. UDL has given Katie's students more autonomy voice in their, and voice in their artwork. And she loves seeing her students so excited about bringing their ideas to fruition. When she's not in the classroom, Katie's painting watercolors, wood burning, or working on a mosaic. Katie is currently attending the summer master's program, The Creative Pulse, at the Un University of Montana, where she's studying interdisciplinary arts and education. And can I just, before you start, um, Katie, how cool that you're also on an art cart. I just think, again, recognizing that we don't care where you're working and teaching and involved with learners we can still bring this, um, bring this to mind, bring this to action. So, all right, thank you. Yes, thank you, and UDL is great on the cart and in the room, both. <laughs> and thanks, Lizzie, and thank you all so much for being here with us. In this segment, I'm going to tell you how I created a reference library that I use in my art room, as well as mobily on my art cart, so that my students could easily access relevant visual references for their artwork. So as educators, art teachers or not, we know how important it is for us to make sure that our work is relevant to our students and it's exciting. And we know that the more relevant it is to them, the more engaged they are in the process of making it and have more voice and ownership in their work in turn. Next and I'll slide. just show the little picture of the UDL guidelines as you're talking about relevancy. I jump right away. I'm thinking about that engagement guideline and right there on the UDL guidelines. So okay, thank you Katie. for throwing that in there. <laughs> um, so I often receive questions from my students, and I'm sure some of you other art teachers can relate. Questions like, how do I draw BB-8 from Star Wars? Or how can I draw this character from Fortnite in my landscape? And questions like this can definitely become a barrier for both teachers and students. So when students have an actual visual reference right in front of them, they have a more accurate representation of the image they want to use in their work. And it helps them hone in on their observation drawing skills as well. So I have listed here the two barriers that I faced in my classroom relating to this were that students did not have the access to relevant visual references to use in their artwork, nor did they have the technology readily available to them that they needed. So my solution was to create the visual reference library. And it's a series of three ring binders of laminated images that are categorized by subject matter. So each binder is labeled with an image that represents its content as well as the written title on both the spine and the cover. So students can easily access um, images that are relevant to them and include them in their artwork and it does not require a Wi-Fi symbol. So they're there. Um, <laughs> and it's always available for them to use in my classroom, um, but it's not a requirement. So I really had to listen to my students and um, ask them, you know, what was relevant to them. And uh, I had to listen to what they were asking me to draw them frequently. And that's how I determined a lot of the categories for the binders. Um, but it's important that you all know this didn't happen overnight. I didn't just like print all these images out and throw them in there. 
<laughs> um, it's been a process of reorganizing and reflecting that's led to this extensive resource. So what started out originally as simply piles of laminated images in baskets um, progressed into subcategories and then a more organized approach with the binders. So for example, I started out with a pile of animals and then I threw all the animals in a binder, but that was just too broad of a binder. So I then had to turn them into animal subcategories like amphibians, birds, reptiles, animal outlines. And then that way it was a little more clear where to find the reference they were looking for. So, and, well, and can I just pause you right there, Katie? So what's so interesting to me is sometimes, you know, educators will say, I want to see what it looks like in a classroom. And you might walk in and you might see a, a pile of binders by the window and just think that that doesn't like look that doesn't look like anything new that looks in fact quite old and dated it's not the latest technology so i think what's so brilliant about this is is the way you describe that really clear goal and that barrier that your students were saying and you started recognizing that that was something that could be designed in the environment you took the tools and resources that you had and helped co-construct it with them and then you needed you know additional organization which again starts to think about you know options for physical action and you were thinking about how um, the information was represented there's a there's a perception component to it um, so again while it looks like something that you'd see in any classroom the thought behind it is so intentional totally thank you so much for bringing up that point and if they really did become a necessary step for me in organizing the visual references that I found myself so and it constantly is this revision and how can I remove more barriers so to keep my binders as up to date as possible and in tune with what my students want, I do keep a running log on the inside cover and students can write the name of a specific Pokemon, for example, that they don't see already and I'll print it out, laminate it and put it into the binder. Not always as quickly as they would like, but I try to get it in there as fast as possible. And some students have even drawn references at home on their own time for me to include in the binder and they bring it in, which is awesome because it's created this really cool student ownership of these binders that I really had never intended for them. But I see students using each other's references all the time, which is really great that it has this whole life of its own uh, now. And it's almost building towards that expert level. You know, what do expert artists do? Well, they're out collecting those images and there's, they're bringing them in and they're studying them and looking at them. Exactly. And sharing. So again, you're really supporting high level um, art, art skills uh, through this exactly. very subtle tool that's in the room. And like we mentioned before, uh, many of us UDL folks were always asking ourselves, how can I make this more UDL? And this is what I've constantly been asking about this project because I see a barrier and I try to address it um, and it is a work in progress. So one way that I've made it more UDL early in the year, you'll see the image on the left. I created a sort basket at one end of the library. So that way, if a student was unsure where their reference came from, they forgot what binder it came from, they can put it in there. Um, and then that way we don't have a bird ending up in the transportation folder or something like that. <laughs> so um, I do have a few helper students that help me throughout the week. They come in and they help me sort it out back into the binder. So that takes a little bit of the, the work of sorting off of me and, ha and the students are actively engaged in that. So also you'll notice the picture on the right, the stickers on there. I'm working on creating a color coding system to make it easier for those sort of students. So the red dotted images go into the red dotted binder. So that's the next step. Very cool. And that, again, just thinking UD, in a UDL way, there are the options for perception. So they can access it through words. They can access it through color codes. They can talk about it together, work on it with you. It's just, it's, it's a very intentional system that's going on on here. Thank you. And finally, here are some examples of artworks from across various grade levels that I teach that have utilized images from the reference library. And when, when students use these references, it's amazing how much their confidence goes up in their ability and their artistic ability, their drawing ability. Um, and instead of using their schema and assuming what something might look like, they have it right in front of them and can look and decipher the shapes um, they see and they're honing in on their observation drawing skills. And to be honest with you, sometimes they aren't drawing from observation. Sometimes they're tracing and I'm okay with that. If the goal of the lesson is not about drawing from observation, if they need to use that as a support for them to get to the next level and build that confidence in their work, then I'm okay with that. 
Um, and it was Picasso who copied all of the masters for years and years, right? Before he definitely made it his own. So. Exactly, a lot of <laughs> artists do. <laughs> um, so overall, UDL, UDL has really allowed me to design my classroom in a way that resources are available and easily accessible to students. It's also helped me to engage students in creating artwork that is relevant and exciting to them. And really, what else could a teacher ask for? <laughs> Engaged uh, learners. <laughs> so next we're going to talk with Anne. Anne has done an amazing job of implementing the growth mindset and UDL in her art room. Anne Rakowski is the visual art educator at Chandler Magnet Elementary School in Worcester, Mass, where she teaches grades K through six. This is Anne's fifth year teaching. She attended Clark University, where she received her master's degree in <laughs> visual art. And Anne is excited and enthusiastic about her students' ownership of their artwork, which she attributes to her work with UDL. She believes that UDL has the power to transform other classrooms and educational institutions. She'll be sharing with us her lesson on visual art and the growth mindset. Yay, so Anne, thank you for joining us. And if you all have any questions that um, you would like to ask Katie, feel free to start adding those into the chat box if you wanna learn more. And again, feel free to visit um, the resource document um, where again, you can kind of see, um, you know, Katie's email is there. Uh, you can see the other presenters and then some of the core content that we're sharing is also available in that digital handout. Uh, so please feel free as we're going along to, uh, you can kind of see uh, how the pattern's gonna work so please feel free to add some questions that you may have for Katie um, and we'll make sure that we're through the course of um, the conversation. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here. Let you, let you kick, it, uh, you, kick it off. Thank you Allison and welcome everyone. I'm going to be talking about the lesson I designed using UDL to explicitly teach the growth mindset in the art room. Last school year, one major barrier I faced was the belief from some of my students that they were not artists. Along with this came crumpled papers and tons of wasted materials and frustrated faces. <laughs> I have to say, I was definitely one of those faces in elementary school art. <laughs> Whoops. Uh <-huh. laughs> that was a little sneak peek. <laughs> um. Thank you. I look to UDL to remove these barriers, um, specifically engagement checkpoint 8.4, increase mastery oriented feedback. Under this checkpoint, it says to provide feedback that models how to incorporate evaluation, including identifying patterns of errors and wrong answers into positive strategies for future success. From here, I developed my learning goal. Um, <laughs> This goal was for students to understand and demonstrate growth mindset thinking in art class. And I'll again just pause you just a second because the growth mindset is right there. Actually, Carol Dweck's work is um, one of the few researchers that gets its own checkpoint within the sustaining effort and persistence guidelines. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, also, I wanted my students to understand that our classroom culture is founded on the belief of the growth mindset, that mistakes are opportunities to learn, grow, and create beautiful things, and that through practice and hard work, we can become better artists. Um, when I talked about the growth mindset with my students, I discussed the process by which learning happens. Um, I gave the example of when you're born, you don't know how to talk or walk or read, but that through practice you can gain these skills. And through doing that, I think I broke down the barriers of the fixed mindset, allowing my students to realize that no one is born smart or not smart, but that intelligence is something that grows. You mean you weren't born an artist? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not. <laughs> um, so then I connected that to art for the students and we talked about being born as an artist or not an artist, but that really the practice is what does it. Practice allows all people to grow in their artistic abilities. Um, and then I think through doing that, my students really started to realize how much they had already grown from like a few previous grades to the point they were at now. And they were also able to see like potential for the future. Um, 
So to support my student learning, I use the book Beautiful Oops and the video Austin's Butterfly. Um, these tools allowed my students to connect with the growth mindset thinking. Um, and the link for both the book and the video can be found in the resource guide. Um, I should also mention that this idea was inspired by another art educator who I saw present at NAEA. Um, and a little bit more about the book is that Beautiful Oops celebrates mistakes. It's a book that's about mistakes and uses them as a jumping point for new artistic discoveries. Um, and Austin's Butterfly is a video about a first grade boy who's learning to draw a butterfly from observation. He uses feedback from his peers as well as practice and hard work to improve over time. Um, so I also look to the NCAS standards to further support my lesson design and highlight particular standards for each of my grade levels that I taught it with. Um, a link to the NCAS standards I use can be found in the resource guide as well. And again, I can't help but to think how much this process could translate. I was a, a science teacher, and I'm again thinking, I want beautiful oops in my science class, and I want that growth mindset in my science class. So again, really thinking about how this is really scaffolding that lifelong learner, um, which is invaluable for us to be able to, to give to our learners. Yeah, and it's something that I feel like students can immediately connect with, too. So probably at any age. <laughs> um, so what I did was I created an oops box by collecting student artwork that was going to be recycled or thrown away um, due to mistakes. And then I also did create some oopses myself using ink <laughs> and coffee. <laughs> um, and so students were able to choose an oops from the box and transform this oops into something beautiful, new, or different using a variety of tools for action or expression. And actually, I didn't think of this, but we could ask our participants right now to just look around them right now at something that's maybe spilled, or I know I actually spilled some coffee on um, one of my handouts here that I was giving out today. What could you maybe make a beautiful oops out of that you would have thrown away, that you would have maybe recycled, and we could have you actively do that right now. But in the interest of time, we'll keep talking. But please, you know, look around and glance and see um, what you could turn into a beautiful oops. <laughs> um. This slide that you guys are now seeing shows a series of images I used when I modeled the lesson for students. Um, the image in the upper left hand corner was the oops that I started with and then you can see how the artwork progresses along. Um, I also used the dinosaur in the middle to model one way to problem solve when you accidentally create an oops on an oops which happens <laughs> frequently in the elementary art classroom. <laughs> So double oops can equal a very dynamic product at the end. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and thank you. A couple of you are noting, um, you know, just a couple comments that your four and six year olds love the beautiful oops book. They turn their mistake into beautiful oopsies especially when writing and drawing. So again, thank you, Teresa and Jennifer, for bringing out, you know, this doesn't have to be um, limited to drawing and, and to art, but to really thinking about um, writing. And um, someone just said they refolded a sticky note into a plane, so it can be great for adults to do too. Um, and thank you also to Wendy to noting, um, you know, kind of thumbs up to Austin's Butterfly um, and how um, you're incrementally co-creating the soft technology of organizing the graphics. Uh, this was for Katie, uh, to help interrupt a student's creativity and open mindset. So I just want to thank you all for a couple of, of those comments um, before we see the next beautiful oops. <laughs> um, so this slide shows one of my students working on her oops. Um, so she's transforming a coffee stain into an artwork of a bird with a flower. Um, I took photos of the student's oopses transformation process and I shared them with my other students and my all of my classes as an exemplar. Um, students were super engaged with this because many of them knew the artist and um, in, this, in the lesson, each photograph um, that you guys are seeing was on its own side, slide, which heightened the anticipation as like students were eager to see what would come next and what she would create. So they really enjoyed watching that unfold. Yeah, and again, kind of just tying this to the guidelines, some of the language that you're using, you know, really thinking about um, how it's authentic and relevant. So again, when it's their own student, their own peers, 
being able to do it. That's got to be very empowering. It's not some famous artist somewhere who has books, but it's someone right next to you turning a coffee stain into a bird. I mean, that's, that's pretty remarkable. And the other one that you noted was just the importance of having, having those model examples. And I often think of that in terms of options for expression and communication when we think of how we're building fluencies with graduated levels of support. So it's almost like when you see one of those models, not only do you want to copy it, like we talked about with Katie, but you kind of want to push it further, which is what Wendy was commenting on in the chat box as well. So that is really exciting. I love how you're building the enthusiasm too, of like, what, what's going to come next? <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to share with you some examples of student work. Um, for more examples, you can full, um, view the full link um, in the resource guide. So this student concluded his artist statement by saying that he felt great about how his artwork turned out and that he had faith in himself. Oh. Um, since my implementation of this lesson, it's been a very regular thing for my students to bring up or refer to the growth mindset in my art room. Um, they're excited about problem solving each other's oopses <laughs> as well as using feedback of others to improve their artwork. So just to ask you a very not fun question, but one that we get a lot from the field is, um, you know, where's the data around the efficacy of UDL? So how would you, I mean, just in terms of what you've observed from this, this approach, do you have an answer to that? And this, I have not asked her this ahead of time, so um, she's not pulling anything. <laughs> um, so I really wish I could have like a video camera like constantly rolling um, <laughs> in my classroom. Um, but I do like I try to jot down notes about times that it does come up. Um, I recently showed my students the video Kane's Arcade, which is about an elementary school student who over the summer transforms his father's workplace into an arcade using cardboard boxes. Um, and I had a student in my class raise her hand and just be like, oh my goodness, Kane is exhibiting the growth mindset. Um, and so I was just thrilled um, <laughs> when she said that or he said that. Um, and just like, I feel like if I continue to document times like that, um, at least in writing, that will be like proof of my work. That's, um, and it is, those are the little moments as educators, that's the evidence for me that can be, re that's invaluable. I mean, just hearing this kiddo here say, I feel great. Um, you know, what might that have felt like in other contexts and other environments? It's very powerful. That's very powerful. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> So it is my aim through the implementation of UDL and teaching growth mindset that I'm empowering my students with an understanding that they can learn and grow in all areas of their life. So I'm really hoping that they do transfer this outside of the art room as well. Um, and I'm going to now end with one more example of student work. And this is an iguana by my student, Alan. He created this with an ink stain and Sharpies. And this is fitting because one of our PLC members is focusing on integrating art with science. Her name is Kate. And I'm going to introduce her. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, so you knew I was going to maybe say one more thing. So again, just thinking across disciplines, where are those oops moments? Where are those oops moments in a history class? When have um, you know, rulers made, had oops moments that they could have turned into anything? Um, again, I think this is really something that can translate across disciplines. And as you're able to gather, as you've done here, Anne, really gather evidence of student work and how they're transforming those and understanding those and sharing them as models with each other, that level of conversation that can really elevate in the classroom to focus on those expert levels skills. So thank you for sharing that. And, and again, you all hear from um, the audience, please feel free to start um, adding thoughts or questions, both for Katie, for Anne, uh, for Liz about this PLC now, as you all may be starting to think more and more about how this, um, again, thinking about how different Katie's work is from Anne's, but yet they're still meeting together. They're still using UDL as their framework. They're using their own goals to think about barriers. Um, so yes, without any further ado, thank you so much, Anne and um, Kate. Take it away. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce Kate. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but then Kate will take it away. Yes. <laughs> 
So Kate Ignazic is an interdisciplinary artist who views her role as an educator, as a facilitator for 21st century skills. The integration of art and ecology are at the center of Kate's teaching and personal pedagogy. She combines her experience in design, sculpture, and cultural management to provide a full spectrum of exploratory options for students to manage and manifest personal success in and out of school. UDL has given Kate a strong foundation to build an interdisciplinary space for student-led inquiry across disciplines. She will share some examples of art and science integration developed over the last year. Awesome, and there's just, Kate, before you begin, there was just a comment that I think is worth saying, thank you all for sharing some of your own personal artwork with the introduction. I do think that's really, it is really fun to see your own, uh, your own style, your colors, and, uh, and that's really added a nice component here. Um, okay, Kate, for real now. <laughs> all right. Sorry. Thanks, Anne and uh, Allison. Um, yeah, so I, have been teaching in the public education system for two years and um, I've made a few observations pretty quickly. Um, I noticed the isolation of the visual arts as a special outside of grade specific curriculums. I noticed student learning habits that worked in opposition to fostering creative process. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the waste of precious resources and little recognition of the waste stream within that process. Um, and my work as an artist hinges on that relationship of art and science. So I started thinking about why that wasn't working sort of within the school system. Uh, so I started my own year long inquiry into waste, both the materials and the opportunities to integrate some of these ideas together. And I started thinking about the fact that the creative process and or the art process and the scientific process really mirror each other. They have the same steps in terms of observation, reflecting and creating a hypothesis and then developing something. And then of course that's a cyclical um, cycle that continues to work through revision and is a major part of any creative endeavor. So uh, this disciplinary separation was a huge barrier for me as an educator and I could see how it was a huge barrier for my students. So I decided that I would try to adopt some of these UDL strategies as a blanket strategy within integrating science and art curriculum. And I thought that it might be a way to embody a second form of primary sources for my students within things that they're already learning in their classroom. But for some learners, they have more access to it visually or by working with it in other ways. So I did this in two ways. I collaborated with teachers in the second grade and I started to use my art club time as an opportunity to let the students lead a progression um, that I would sort of foster through this observation hypothesis and experimentation strategy. So our goal was to encourage, well my goal was to encourage experimentation and mindfulness towards environmentally conscious practices um, with this science and art integration. And I love how you've gone from a very concrete goal, like to have less waste, to something that's really expert and again, transcending cross disciplines and across systems even that are, that are present in your site. Fabulous. Yes, break the system. That's sort of my strategy. <laughs> um, so initially we started working together, the second grade teachers and I collaborating specifically with their science standards. We picked one unit per quarter that I could help them um, embed some of the learning from science within an art class, but also as a separate integration block per week. Um, so it was pretty straightforward. We identified their standard, I tied it to one of my standards, and we moved forward. Our first unit was Habitats. Um, it was pretty collaborative for both the students and the teachers. It was fun to sort of see together how the students reacted um, to us working together. Um, and so then it ebbed into Landforms, which is a direct standard that they need to create a model in 3D in their science standards, but within the art standards, we have describing characteristics of the natural world, which they had already started to think about within habitats. So 
uh, I thought it was a great opportunity to move from 2D to 3D and just keep pushing that sort of reciprocal revisioning process of thinking about how something looks 2D and how it becomes 3D. And then once it's 3D, how does it continue to change? So we started using um, their own observations about landscape and land and expressions of form. I gave them a lesson on kneading and pinch pots. And then we started talking about concave and convex and how a landform is really a change in the surface of the earth. So we started there. And the students, you can see at the top picture, their observations of landscape. This is a collaborative process where they were drawing a landscape based on whatever landforms they could think of. Of course, is directly related to what they were talking about in their science curriculum. Um, the picture to the right is their drawings and their initial 3D landforms derived out of a pinch pot form. And then on the left is their experiment. Once they started thinking about what that form looked like, they added more color and detail in diagramming. Then they colored their landforms. So you can see sort of the full spectrum of that whole process here. Very so, cool. And again, that, that way that you've combined both the art with the science in that cycle makes it so concrete. <laughs> well, and it's fun because I, we kept talking about the cycle, right? That it's really important to keep revisioning or reobserving and thinking about how something can get better, which is a part of the creative process. But it was nice to see them do it through science instead. We move from that into engineering. And uh, the science standard that we were trying to hit was about specific materials and their intended purpose, but I was really focused on repurposing objects and making something new out of something old, which of course related really directly to my ideas about waste. So we started with recycled materials. You can see in the top pictures, these little forms um, that the students had, they were just sort of sorting through a bunch of trash that I had collected. <laughs> Yes. And we were just observing strength and quality standards and thinking about how they might make it stand up by itself and they could sketch or record in writing. Then we reviewed bridge structures. You can see in the bottom right corner a drawing um, that a student did, including I gave them directions on how to draw different types of bridges. Then they designed their own bridge, like an engineer would make a design, and then Did they Katie applied. have a binder of bridges? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. We haven't discussed that. <laughs> um, so then they applied that bridge to a realistic environment. Where that ended up was the image on the left, that they experimented in collaborative teams with building a structure out of the found materials, which you can see is just cardboard, old straws, paper clean or pipe cleaners and paper tubes. Uh, they had to make it stand by itself. It had to support the weight of one pair of scissors and it could not use tape or glue. So a complete uh, success where the students have fully embraced this sort of experimental process within their science thinking, but also as an artist thinking about like that failure is a possibility and not the end point. Again, connecting there with Anne's work and the growth mindset, great. <laughs> yes, very much so. So with my older students, I was really trying to push a little bit less structured in terms of the teacher um, instruction and really let the students lead the um, inquiry. So I started with my third and fourth grade and I just pulled out a bunch of old construction paper scraps that I had and we talked about it. They played with them, they separated them into color groups. And so we started thinking about what could we do with all of these crumbs of paper. And we arrived at making paper. So the students did some research, um, curated by me somewhat, but mostly just started tearing up paper and diluting it in water and starting to think about suspension and all of those parts of science that they were studying elsewhere, um, but how they could turn that old paper into new paper. Even more important within that process was the fact that they were starting to ask questions like, where does paper come from? What is it made of? Why do we waste so much? And like, what, why aren't we doing this across our whole school? So you can just see within their process, um, and I have some really great videos, which I have to put up in the resources page, but um, the students really 
owned this process. This is a process that happened with a different group of students every week. So the students owned the process of sharing the steps with each other so that everybody got a chance to make paper throughout. This is about a half a year, so two quarters. With my there's a really a great question here that I'm just going to I'm going to ask all of you, but not ask you to respond yet, but just to start thinking about the question of um, if you have a student with physical challenges, how does some of this design help support, um, you know, again, the variability in physical um, abilities that we have in our classroom. So again, not to um, have just have that percolating as, as we continue the conversation. Okay. Um, I pose a similar question to my fifth and sixth grade students and I just opened up a giant bin of old markers that was left to be my me by my predecessor. And so I just said, what do you think we can do with these things? And basically they just said, throw them away, which of course was yeah. not the case. So um, I gave them pairs of pliers and asked them to dissect the markers and see what happens inside a marker. So as soon as they opened them up, they started understanding how a marker works and why it dries up when you don't leave the caps on. So they started editing their own process. And then um, they developed a sort of a lab report for other students on how you could make ink out of the old markers. So um, you can see them at the top doing their observation of what a marker is made out of. Um, the one, the image on the right was them diluting the markers in different amounts of water and they figured out that like 250 milliliters was a good um, dilution to get a nice ink. So they started by then draining that out or straining that out and using it as liquid watercolor. Then they started asking questions like, well, this is great as liquid watercolor, but what about tempera paint and what about um, watercolors? So they started using cornstarch and flour and salt to make their own paints and solid and um, more opaque forms. So you can see on the left, this image of these two boys um, who are fully engaged and enamored with this idea of making paint out of this product that they had produced by themselves. And so um, I think, my takeaways as an educator about this are that um, the art room has really turned into a space, that environment that I was seeking, that it's understood that we're promoting rigorous experimentation, risk taking, and um, that it's a place where you can synthesize your skills and your knowledge as assets. Um, but the students have taken it so much further. They have started this infinity arts group, which you can imagine the metaphor there, um, but they are, they've developed a, a school-wide collection and distribution network to take all of the materials from different classrooms and bring them to the art room and make new materials from them and start a store that they can then sell the products back to the students as a reward system and they want to like go on Instagram and be <laughs> on Facebook but so it fully encompasses engagement and um, has gone far beyond what I've ever imagined it's so different than compliance to zero waste. It really has gone, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm so happy that you mentioned that it's, it's about rigor, it's about high expectations, it's about going for gold and going beyond where you think it may by giving students, again, that choice, that autonomy to be able to take it where they wanna go. Um, amazing, thank you. So if you all could continue to, to add questions and thoughts in the, in the chat box and we're gonna keep moving just in our interest of time. Okay. Well, so um, speaking of engagement, I'm going <laughs> to my colleague, Liz, who is a full inclusion K-8 to educator, uh, visual art teacher at Gardner Pilot Academy in Boston Public Schools, serving a high need and diverse student body. She has a master's degree in art education from Harvard Graduate School of Education and a master's degree in special ed education from Lesley University. She has a book coming out this summer on UDL and, and visual art, published by Cass, yay. And her primary <laughs> art form is sculpture and oil painting. She will be sharing with us a lesson focused on engagement in the visual arts. Thank you so much. Am I unmuted? I am. Thanks so much, Kate. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, my UDL story starts with instructional challenges or barriers. And the students that I've been teaching have been engaged in a unit on 3D construction. The instruction had been UDL to the best of my ability, yet my perception of what they needed and what the barriers they'd faced were wrong. The curriculum had led students to a place where most were frustrated 
almost all students wanted to make a house cut out of cardboard and they had a predisposed idea of what it should look like. This really left them frustrated beyond the productive struggle. They argued with each other, they didn't share materials, they didn't collaborate, and the materials they were using were not viewed as having multiple uses. And so you could think about it as artistic tunnel vision. <laughs> the curriculum and learning environment had generated a negative reaction to class, which is not what we want, obviously. And this is really important because the barriers were in the content and lessons, not the students. I needed to do something differently, but I did not want to just abandon the unit and goal. You can go but to the we could have blamed the students. We absolutely we could have. Just said, you know what, they just aren't getting it. They should just know that you can do lots with cardboard. And you, they even asked for this unit on cardboard. It's their fault. It's not. I presented it in some way that wasn't working. So it led me to gamify the 3D construction unit in a series of art lessons that mirrored the reality TV show Chopped. Part of our PLC, in, in addition to focusing on UDL, has also focused on culturally responsive instruction, or CRT. And connecting UDL to culturally responsive teaching, Zaretta Hammond, who's um, an author that we, we read and, and had assignments on, she's a CRT guru. She named gamifying lessons as one of the key ways to making lessons more culturally relevant. And so Art Chopped was also an attempt to further deepen the cultural responsibility of my lessons. So you can go to the next slide. If you're not familiar with Chopped, um, in this case, in the art classroom, the premise is simple. Students are in teams of two to five. Each team gets a bag of mystery materials and they have 15 minutes to make a work of art with only those materials. All bags have the same materials. And pictured here are the bags from one of the lessons and their contents laid out on the table. And you can go to the next slide. Before beginning, I activated their prior knowledge. I asked them to share out what they know about the TV show Chopped. Then I presented students with this slide, which outlined the goals and the rules of the game. Teams were given 30 seconds to determine a team name, just real quick. And we used a free online timer, which has two representations of time, the digital countdown and a yellow circle, which gradually becomes more full as time passes. And I personally, as a teacher, I project my slides onto a whiteboard. So it's kind of like a fake smart board. And I wrote their team names on the whiteboard into a grid, which was on the slide being projected. I rewrote the goal of the lesson on this slide to ground their work. And the rubric used for scoring was made clear before they began. And then we used it at the end to judge their work. Which is very executive function support. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome, Allison. Always a pleasure. <laughs> I, I just, this is not an original idea. I had learned about Chopped at a conference and the concept was great, but the way it was presented to the students, at least at the conference, Mm -hmm. was really written with barriers for my particular students. So before I presented Chopped, I didn't use it the cookie cutter way it was presented at the conference. And you can go to the next slide. My yeah, yeah. really needed multiple means of representation, action and expression, and engagement. And like you just noted, executive functioning, to understand this new game, to fully engage in it and be successful. And I wanted them to reach the goal of being able to approach 3D construction in a novel way. So it helped reset their perspective on what art could be. But without UDL, I think it also would, might have crashed and burned. Um, and anyway, the exact UDL checkpoints I used and how I use them, they're in the resources guide where I've listed um, access to a Google Doc where I've written out kind of the thinking and the strategies behind all of it. Uh, and we also anchor everything to the National Core Art Standards. So all of also my co-presenters, we all um, start with the barriers, the goal, and standards. So everything is tied together. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Allison. So I chose to share this lesson with all of you because it's applicable to all grade levels with adaptations depending on developmental need. It's also a concept you could employ in other subjects. And I found that the progression rubric pictured on this slide 
by Katie Novak and Kristen Rodriguez is an incredibly powerful tool in reflecting on my own practice. If you haven't already looked at it, definitely look at it. It's in the resources document. As the end goal in expert practice, if you look at their rubric, it often includes the word empower. So this is something I aim for. But I think some of this lesson didn't empower students in all the ways I had hoped. It directed them toward being empowered in art. But in reality, I had to take the UDL lessons I had implemented and I had to step backward because those lessons had inherent barriers. So I'm working towards that empowerment, but being honest with myself of where this lesson took them wasn't completely there. And you can go to the last slide. These were the final results. <laughs> so we were trying to know what they created. So uh, these were some of the final results from the top, from left to right and top to bottom. We have a pig, a taco and drinks, an abstract piece that was front and back. Don't know what it is. And it, there was a person or a face. And in short, while I had originally planned with UDL, my lessons and approach to 3D art making, it was not working for my students. And gamifying the project, and infusing it with collaboration while keeping the options for creating broad brought the students back to being engaged in visual art and more open-minded about the creative process. It has set the stage for empowering them to create more complex pieces in art. You can see all this and more in the resources um, document. And I just would love to introduce our next presenter knowing we are nine minutes left, 10 minutes left in our, um, a presentation. Is that okay with you, Allison? We're going to go. Okay. <laughs> Libby Fortin, who's going to be sharing the progression of her application and understanding of UDL over the course of three years. Uh, she is a high school art educator at North High School in Worcester. Lizzie is a mixed media artist who has committed a daily practice of creating a collage a day. UDL has breathed life into her practice as an educator and as a human. Lizzie is passionate about student-centered learning and removing barriers so all students can access curriculum. She believes that relationships with students is the key to education. Lizzie is going to share her progression of understanding and implementing UDL within a social issue art unit. Take it away, Lizzie. Thank you, Liz. Um, so in my first year of understanding and using UDL, I did a unit on social issues with my Foundations of Art students. The goal for this unit that year was to create an artistic response to a social issue using materials and media of your choosing. At the time, I was pleased with this goal and thought it allowed for lots of options. I also created a PowerPoint to share artwork with students and had students create a proposal using lots of different methods like conferencing, voice recording, and on paper. Unfortunately, the outcomes were heavily biased on what I had chosen to share. Many students found relevancy within the goal, but many did not. I heard a lot from students within that year. Most issues don't affect me. Upon reflecting on this unit, I realized that I was successful in using the guidelines for, um, for communication, but I was super text heavy. The resources I shared and one of the students to use weren't accessible at all. They were long, long, long websites on a sheet of paper. So they weren't hyperlinks or QR codes. And honestly, the goal was not clear. The next year, um, I thought about what I had learned before and started to deepen my understanding of the guidelines and my implementation of them. I also was responding to the presidential election results while planning this lesson. Uh, so I altered my goal for students to create a piece of art that responds to a social issue through causing a viewer to interact, think, or react. So instead of just a PowerPoint with flat images, I incorporated videos and had students reflect and answer questions. I also incorporated more relevant artists. The outcomes, again, were mainly successful. Students had definitely found room for their voices within. And reflecting on this second year, I found that I had done a better job of providing options for perception. So I used QR codes and videos. I definitely increased relevancy and value for students, especially in response to the election results. But I could have improved my feedback for students, and students were not able to reach part of the goal. Uh, the portion about causing a viewer to interact, think, or react. I just hadn't planned or scaffolded that in any way. So moving into this current year, this year right now, um, I looked hard at the past two years, the goal and the guidelines. 
and I focus heavily on options for sustaining effort and persistence, comprehension, and executive function. I really looked at where I had fallen down in planning in the previous years and worked hard at those areas. So my goal did not change at all, but my planning for the entirety of the goal did. So again, I use a slideshow with videos and contemporary artists, except this time I varied how the response would be. So some would be private in notes and other responses would be public on a post-it. So some of the responses were to questions like, have you ever really thought about how it might feel? in another person's skin, gender, or religion? What might be different about your life? I also searched for relevant contemporary artists that mirrored my students and their backgrounds and their interests. So we looked at work such as Ai Weiwei's piece that wraps migrants life jackets around Berlin's concert house and Hank Willis Thomas's interactive installation, Truth. We also watched spoken word poetry by Maida DelVal, Why I'm Loud as Hell, and Darius Simpson and Scott Bosley's poem, The First Time I Realized I Was Black. Students' responses to this day of hard watching, listening, responding, and reflecting were things like, why can't we do more stuff like that? This was the best day of class so far. And that was lit, which is my favorite thing they say. <laughs> uh, the second part of my goal was a huge focus in my planning. I wanted to ensure students knew how artists engage viewers. So we looked at a lot of work. I had them all printed out so students could touch them. And they curated the images together. So they saw how artists interacted with viewers, they shocked viewers, and they intrigued viewers. They collaboratively took notes and they shared out their findings. This sharing of information helped later on when students were creating their work and how they could become master artists or expert artists and they reached their goals by looking at those that they had started before they worked on their pieces. And so also creating interactive artwork was imperative in making the goal relevant and engaging. As students entered the room on different days, I gave them sheets of paper, one with the hashtag I wish my teacher knew and one with the hashtag I need. They filled them out and they put them in the room. Some are poignant and heart-wrenching. I need people to not think every Muslim is the same while others were typical high school. I need, I need clear skin, good grades, and healthy friendships. I wish my teacher knew that sometimes I don't understand something, I don't usually ask them to explain again. And I wish my teacher knew that students learn differently, that some students can work by listening to their own music and how to interact with students to get to know them. Wow. The research students did in the past had certainly been lacking in accessibility and relevancy, but I knew I couldn't possibly find or support every social issue. So I created a Symbolu board with a variety of resources. I wanted them to understand what a good resource looked like, and I wanted them to dig into those resources. And I wanted them to figure out what they could do with the information. So I shared with them podcasts and videos and websites in that Symbolu board. The student outcomes were stronger this year in idea generation and in depth. Student understand, understood the topics they were working with, like the piece on the left. This student wrote in her artist statement, my piece is on gender inequality and the abuse of women all over the world. I chose this because it's an issue that I've always been interested in, and I finally got the time to learn more about it. Uh, on the right, it is, uh, students were making connections from the research into their own lives, and the artist statement from on the right says, this art, artwork depicts racism between white Americans and African Americans. What is obvious is the same administrator saying two different things to both men in the picture. The next slide. Uh, and students were connecting the artists we had looked at to their work. The student artist on the left used a similar process to Kara Walker, utilizing a silhouette to simplify portions of his imagery while also focusing on race and the hatred he has experienced for being black. Students knew how to represent their ideas and engage the viewer in ways I was so impressed with. The students on the right created an interactive piece that hung in the hallway, prompting the school com community to, to respond to the question, what do you think of when you see me with the imagery of a woman wearing a hijab? Next slide. Oh, Lizzie, this is crazy. This is so moving. <laughs> and we're getting comments like that from, from the viewers as well. So I'm gonna let you keep going. Um, so in closing, I wanna share that my understanding of UDL has grown deeper in the past three years. And so has my implementation. The first unit I shared was not a failure by any means. And this year's unit is not the end of this work either. By constantly reflecting on the learning and the goals while also continuing to deepen my understanding of UDL, the better I support my students becoming expert learners and expert artists. And all of the resources, so um, there's tons of resources that I left on um, 
the resource page. So there are two links to my blog that has every resource I used um, and lots more student examples. And we do want to emphasize that this is meant our goal to be the start of the conversation with these teachers, with you all, and with the field. So this is just the beginning. So we can have you all back again. We could feature, you know, one at a time. I feel like this could be an entire five-part series. Um, there are, again, five actions that we really hope that you all um, are able to think about um, in connection to each one of the guests today. So thinking about the barriers in your classroom, use the guidelines for solutions, try it out. Out. Goals can be of content or growth mindset. Craft clear student goals across disciplines without means embedded. Read, reflect on, and use the UDL progression rubric. And this one, just be patient with yourself. As Lizzie described, this is a process. It's iterative. It requires deep reflection and deep thought and, and, um, and conversations with each other. We can support each other in conversations with our students um, in the process. And so we really, um, please do, um, share, um, connect with these folks. They've shared their emails. They've shared um, Twitter accounts. Please reach out. Um, we do want to thank you all for being here. And um, Liz has a book coming out called Art for All, Planning for Vari Variability in the Visual Arts Classroom. And you can pre-order today from CAST and save 20% on your entire order. So if you just share, if you enter the code ARTWEB18 during checkout, 20% will be taken off your entire order. So please visit CAST, uh, CAST Publishing. Um, for more information and there are other ways that you can get in touch so we have an annual our annual symposium excuse me coming up I'm really choked up um, coming up this summer July 30th to August 1st here in Cambridge Massachusetts Mass Some great um, resources on our AIM Center. New teachers sign up for a free online course on making accessible educational materials. Maybe that will help get to the question, again, that was asked earlier by one of um, the participants. And CAST is hiring, and um, please donate to CAST. We are um, you know, always trying to change the world. And uh, we want to hear from you, so we do have a concluding um, survey um, for some feedback. Again, you can let us know about how this webinar is, if you want more of this, um, and ideas for future webinars. Webinars. And I want to thank the guests for this quote, too. Uh, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And I think your stories really reflected that you are there to really think about how each of your flowers are blooming. And given that it's finally spring here in New England, I know you all are moving into summertime. I hope that you're able to take a chance to reflect on your practices, connect with each other. Um, you all, thank you so much. I, I mean, I, I'm getting very choked up. This group um, is a power Powerful group. They've done this on their own, on their own time, um, because they care about it, and each one of their students is benefiting from it. So, um, so thank you all so much for being here today. Liz, do you want to say anything final as well? This group of teachers is amazing, and what blows your, what will blow your mind is that these are only four of the PLC members. Every single one of our PLC members is just as mind-blowingly good. Not just at implementing UDL, but at being reflective, authentic, real, down to earth, grounded in the standards, looking at barriers, having a growth mindset. And yeah, I get choked up too. I get to work with them every week. I love this group. They're in Worcester Public Schools. I just seem like <laughs> So come visit us, reach out, and please, again, let us know um, what you want to hear next, and we will continue these conversations. Thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. We'll stay on for a couple more moments if there are questions from the field, um, but we recognize that we're a couple minutes past five, so please feel free to head on in your day. Um, it is five o'clock here, <laughs> um, and, and so we'll hang on if you, if you all do have any questions, but otherwise, please feel free to log off, and, and thanks for joining us.